Hi folks. So we've set the stage for understanding how our immune response works because we've talked about the lymphatic organs that are involved, both the primary and secondary organs. We've talked about the different kinds of white blood cells that you find in plasma that can then migrate out of the bloodstream. They literally squeeze between the cells that line the capillaries, which you'll remember are called endothelial cells. All right, so our immune system has two arms, if you want to think about it that way. One is called the innate immune response, and the word innate means inborn. This is the part of the immune system that we come into the world with. The acquired or adaptive immune response is acquired. So you develop it in response to your experience with the environment, including the prenatal environment. It's adaptive in the sense that it's very, very specific. The response is specific on a molecular level to things that you encounter in the environment, whereas the innate immune response is considered nonspecific. The cells of the innate immune system can recognize that something is in a general way out of place, but you don't have the same kind of exquisite targeting that we see with the acquired adaptive immune response. So we have two overlapping mechanisms that work together. The adaptive immune response takes longer to get started because it develops over time, not just throughout our lives, but each time you're exposed to a pathogen for the first time, there's an entire process that has to happen. Whereas the innate immune system, you get everything thrown at the system at once. And in fact, the first line of defense is really prevention as opposed to actual defense. The first line of defense is about barriers to infection. Molecules and structures that, <clears throat> excuse me, that keep pathogens from getting inside the body. The second line of defense comes into play once a barrier has been breached and now some sort of pathogen has entered the body, the living, and has contact with living cells. This includes the inflammatory response and a, a host of other things that we're going to talk about in a future video. The third line of defense, as I said, is very specific. And it's not so much that this line of defense kicks in when the second line of defenses fail, but rather that you don't see it because it takes time for this process to develop. And in fact, sometimes you won't, um, you won't be aware of this at all. And it's actually quite common. We know, we know that this happens because we can measure the adaptive immune response by looking for specific antibodies in blood plasma. With the exception of autoimmune diseases, we only produce antibodies to foreign molecules and cells. So that's how you know if you've been exposed to something like COVID-19, for example. Here's another example. A lot of first responders have this experience with the bacterium that causes tuberculosis. So if you're an EMT or police officer or firefighter or you work in the emergency department, you can be exposed to tuberculosis and develop an immune response. You may never develop an active infection. 
And that's because the immune system, your adaptive or acquired immune system, has come in been super snappy and dealt with a threat before you ever felt bad. This is also, that's the basis for vaccination, which results in immunization. The idea here is that we sort of front load your experience with something about a pathogen in order that when you do see the actual real thing, you have a big response right away. So here we're looking at a very brief summary, just an outline of what we're going to cover in this course about innate immunity. The first line of defense, which is really prevention, are physical and chemical barriers to the entry of pathogenic microbes. The second barrier to entry, or sorry, not barrier, but the second part, or the second The second, a second wave of defense is the inflammatory response. And this includes a number of different, uh, uh, different cells molec and, and molecules, phagocytes, protective proteins, natural killer cells. We'll talk more about those in the next video. All right, so the first line of defense. We've got three physical barriers to entry. Now, there are lots of different physical barriers to entry, and there are certainly plenty of ways in which you could argue that intact skin is both a physical and a chemical barrier. Leave all of that complexity for anatomies too, right? That's point one. Point two, please be sure you know these three physical barriers and the three chemical barriers that I'm going to talk about. I realize there are lots of them, but I want you to be, I, well, I don't want you to be surprised when you um, get to an exam and Suddenly, you see these, and that's not what I wrote in my concept check, right? So just be sure, if you're interested in this, read or watch all you want, but just be sure you know these as well. All right, enough said. So the first physical barrier we're going to talk about is intact skin. Remember, the upper layer of skin is called the epidermis, and it is made of stratified squamous epithelium. And the upper layer of cells are non-living, and they separate the sterile inside of the body, where we have living cells, from the outside world. Another way of referring to skin um, is to call it a cutaneous membrane. The word cutis means skin in Latin, I believe. And again, right? remember the epidermis is made up of many layers of epithelial cells. You have the stem cells right here above the dermis. As these cells divide, they push the cells above them up. The closer those cells get to the surface, the more and more keratin they produce. That's the waterproof protein or the, the hydrophobic protein that gives our skin, it's part of what gives our skin, it's waterproof character. And once you get up to the layers of dead skin, what you see are cells that, although they're no longer living, are still essentially bolted together with adhesive junctions. 
So they form a continuous barrier. The next physical barrier is intact mucous membranes. Now you will remember from when we talked about the digestive and respiratory tracts that any molecules or pathogens or anything that you put in the digestive tract or in the respiratory tract or not technically inside your body. The cells that create mucus are modified epithelial cells. And again, this is about separating the inside of the body from the outside environment. So here's a cartoon of what that might look like. We've got epithelial cells here. <clears throat> um, we've got an inner mucus layer, which is protective of these living cells. You have the outer mucus layer, which is where you might find commensal bacteria or pathogenic bacteria. And then we have the lumen of, in this case, the digestive tract. All right, finally, the last physical barrier that we want you all to know are what, for lack of a better term, I just air quotes, good bacteria. These are called flora or commensals, commensal bacteria. And these are present in and on our body. Um, doesn't matter how much you wash, you can't get rid of them, um, nor would you want to. They provide a physical barrier because they outcompete pathogens for food and space, right? So they have evolved with us, in us, on us, um, and they specialize in not damaging us, but making a living, as opposed to a pathogen, which makes its living by damaging us. And this graphic is just, I think, sort of interesting. It's just showing that the, um, the commensals on our body are different in different areas, which makes sense. Um, each of those different areas is essentially a different habitat. So you've probably heard the term microbiome. It's been in the news in the last couple years or so. And this graphic is, is just to sort of flesh that idea out a little bit. So what we refer to as probiotics are commensal bacteria, the helpful kind, right? They produce uh, antibiotics that target certain pathogenic bacteria. Um, they excrete molecules or secrete molecules, I should say, that increase mucus production, which then enhances the barrier function of the mucus membrane. And the outcome of this is the prevention of pathogenic infection, so either bacterial or viral infections. On the other hand, pathogenic bacteria release what are called inflammatory cytokines. We'll talk more about cytokines in a later video, but uh, inflammation can damage the barrier function of either the cutaneous membrane or mucous membranes. Some of these pathogens actually also secrete factors that spur 
our own cells on to become cancerous. And the end result is bacterial and viral infections, and potentially over long, long periods of time, cancer. All right, so on to chemical barriers to entry. The first one I'm going to talk about is sebum. And you'll remember sebum is what is produced by the sebaceous glands. Um, it contains a lot of different lipids. And as you'll remember, lipids are defined by not dissolving in water. So they seal in moisture. They seal it essentially allow the, the tissue fluid around our cells to not be dehydrated. That in turn helps the skin stay intact. Sebum also contains antibacterial molecules and it has a low pH, which is why your skin has a low pH, a lower pH, not super low like stomach acid, but lower than neutral. And most bacteria do not like acidic pH. Next we have gastric fluid. And you can just think of this as stomach acid because that's the component that we're most interested in here. Stomach acid has a very low pH, a pH of one to two. So a low number, which means a lot of hydrogen ions. Stomach acid is, has about the same acidity as battery acid. Um, now, most microbes can't tolerate that kind of, um, that, that kind of acidity. And so that keeps most bacteria from entering the body. And then finally, this is really more, I suppose I should have said under three, the enzyme lysozyme, which there's a little image of it over here. Remember, enzymes are proteins that make it easier for chemical reactions to happen. In this case, chemical reactions that um, destroy bacteria, and we find lysozyme in sweat, in saliva, in tears, and in breast milk. So that is your tour through the barriers to infection, the first line of defense. Next, we're going to talk about acute inflammatory response. And I want to stress that it's the acute inflammatory response we're talking about, not chronic inflammation, which is a different beast.